Female genital mutilation FGM comprises all procedures that involve altering the female genitalia for non-medical reasons and is recognized internationally as a violation of the human rights, the health and the integrity of girls and women. Girls who undergo female genital mutilation face short-term complications such as severe pain, shock, excessive bleeding, infections and difficulty in passing urine sometimes and as well as uh, long-term consequences for consequences for their sexual and reproductive health and mental health. Female genital mutilation, otherwise known as a female circumcision, constitutes a major concern for state and non-state actors and the United Nations Children's Fund, UNICEF, is at the forefront spearheading of a campaign to end female genital mutilation. According to UNICEF, this practice remains widespread in Nigeria. Although disparities in practice exist, the national FGM prevalence rate among girls and women aged 15 and 49 is 20% with the state's uh, FGM prevalence ranging from 62% in Imo State, that's in the uh, eastern part of the country, to less than 1% in another uh, state in the north, that's Adamawa and Gumbe State. Now, disturbed by this uh, worrying trend, UNICEF, in collaboration with the Nigerian government, uh, launched a uh, community-led initiative to eliminate uh, the harmful practice in five Nigerian states uh, with where FGM is highly prevalent. Um, these states are Ebonyi, Ekiti, Imo, Oshun and Oyo. Now, tagged the movement for good, it is uh, projected that it will reach 5 million adolescents boys and girls, men and women inclusive, uh, through an online pledge to say no to FGM. This will be our issue on the table tonight. This is Nigeria Today, and we have guests to talk around these issues, uh, to have conversations around it. I am Muspad and Wahab, and this is NCA News 24. Meet my guests in just a moment. Thanks a lot for sticking around. It's Nigeria Today on NTA News 24 and joining me to provide more insights on this uh, human rights violation is Asmao Benzis Leo. Uh, she is a gender and development expert. So good to have you, madam. Good evening and it's my pleasure. Right. And also have the country representative of UNICEF uh, in Nigeria, Peter Hawkins. Good to have you. Good evening. Great right. to be here. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about uh, this collaboration, but let me start uh, from uh, Madame Asmao. Why is um, a female genital mutilation now um, a violation of human rights? This used to be a practice in um, parts of this country. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Bao. The practice of FGM, and some other people call it uh, FGC, that's female genital cutting, depending on the context you're looking at. Is something that even though, yes, we know statistically it has reduced, but the practice is still prevalent in most of our communities. I, it's alarming that even my own state, Adama State, is mentioned among one of the states that has the higher rate of uh, FGM. In very low. Yeah, or the, one of the lowest, yeah, in, the, um, in Nigeria. So basically the, the uh, issues of social, uh, cultural norms and values uh, sometimes people mistake it to also be religious, but I don't think there's any religious uh, connotation to the uh, aspect of uh, FGM. It is basically culture. And culture, like we know, is endemic. It's the way of life of the people. We were all socialized to know some communities. Without you going through this uh, process of FGM in some communities, you might be lacking your dignity as a human being. In fact, it is an honor to you as an individual, especially to the girl child and to the family, to be caught. But we know that many women, many girls, have suffered a lot of untold hardship, both with their sexual and reproductive health, as you mentioned in the introduction, and also to their mental health, even to their own confidence as women. So for me, there, there is a whole lot that women suffer from. So the benefits of it, if at all there is, 
at, uh, the, the, the disadvantage of it rather outweighs the benefit that people talk about. Because when I look at it, sometimes when you, you, you get to discuss to find out, I, I, I was in Senegal actually to, to, with an organization called Tostan. And one of the things that took us there was to even look at how Senegal was able to work with young women in the communities to abolish this act. There's a, a, a white woman called, an American called um, Molly. And Molly has lived in Senegal all her life, close to 30 to 40 years. And she has worked with the people in the community. Right now, Senegal, if you look at the statistics of women that have suffered from um, FGM, they have, it has reduced drastically. And again, those women that have suffered have now become, many of them have become advocates to the abolition of such acts. So why can't we do the same in Nigeria? Well, all right. So you mentioned some uh, reasons for this, uh, some religious, some um, cultural. Uh, and now, from your research, what have you found that's um, responsible for this practice? Why are people practicing it? What have been their justification for it? It's something that has been passed down to them from generation to generation. And sadly to say, women are the custodian of this culture. Right. So if we are talking about FGM, it's not something that you go to begin to advocate to women to abolish it. You first begin to advocate to the women themselves, especially to older women, uh, mothers, grandmothers, mother-in-laws, aunties, those are the ones that perform this act. So the advocacy sensitization should start from them before it even gets to the men. So this is an issue of woman to woman right now. It's not that we are advocating for men to be involved. First, we want to deal with the issue women to women before we even get to the men who are also as fathers, as traditional rulers, as religious rulers, that are also enablers to these practices. All right, well, we're not going to leave this issue for you as a woman alone. Let's bring in Peter uh, to also talk about this. Uh, what has been the social impact of uh, FGM across the world? We are talking about the cultural aspects mm -hmm. and uh, the beliefs that people have about it. What has been the social uh, impact? Well, it, it has a violent impact on, on young girls and women as they go through uh, their life. There is no physiological or biological evidence to show that there are any advantages. In right. natural fact, exactly the opposite. The physical pain, the, phys the threat to, of fistula for young mothers is so uh, enormous and there are no, no advantages at all. 200 million, we estimate that 200 million, million survivors of FGM globally. Nigeria has about 10% of that, 19.9, 19.8%. Uh, million survivors. That is an incredible f figure, as Osman said, that it's still there in the community. It's still there perpetrated, mainly in the south, east and the southwest. About 65% is there. And then there are hotspots elsewhere around the country. We estimate that there are 4 million children at risk every year. That is an enormous number at, at risk for some sort of cultural uh, heritage, if you want for a better term. I, I would agree with Sosom, this is a woman to woman's issue, but men have to be involved in that decision making. It is a perception that it's only a woman problem. It's not. It, we have to, it's society as a whole, the religious leaders, political leaders, who, and there is a, little, a lot of political effort going on behind the scenes. Yeah. And today it was demonstrated with the Minister of Women's Affairs, Minister of Health, we're out there to say, come on, let's get this uh, in control and let's stop FGM in Nigeria. Okay, we won't stop um, FGM in Nigeria. Can you uh, tell us in how many countries, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, have you stopped uh, visa practice? Is it achievable? Do you think it's what you can um, uh, get an end to? It's, it's almost impossible to stop it, but say for example in, in, in the UK it's illegal to, to have uh, FGM not only in itself but also to take children out of the country to ensure to to get the female uh, genital mutilation uh, done the cutting done and so and courts are pursuing people who persevere in trying to get young girls uh, cut uh, in uh, across Africa there are many countries where uh, Senegal is a good example where it's gross, uh, reduced substantially Nigeria is probably reduced between 20 to 25 percent and that's that's about all um, as long as one child is uh, female uh, a female girl is genitally mutilated that is one child too many all right 
Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Now, Asma, you, you have talked about it, but um, no gains at all. But um, some of I've heard people uh, talk about why it is necessary. Some talked about uh, what it can lead to if you leave a lady or a girl uh, without uh, doing this uh, circumcision. Can you unravel this um, belief? Yeah, there's a lot, there are a lot of uh, misconceptions to this issue. And some say it's a rite of passage for family honor, while others say it's a process for a woman to be uh, marriageable. Uh, some say it is something that is honorable for every girl, girl child, who is uh, growing into an adolescent and into womanhood to be caught. But for me, I look at it as a woman. What is the dignity in being caught? I was having a conversation some time ago with a friend of mine that was caught. We went for a program, and unfortunately for her, that was the first time she ever realized that it was a crime. It was indeed a crime, violation of her right as a child to be caught. She said in her community, it's something that is a taboo if a girl in a family is not caught. That family stands to be ostracized or either stigmatized. That means nobody is going to marry any girl in that family. Nobody is going to associate with your parents or even you. So for the fear of being stigmatized in a family, you know how uh, you know, homogeneous the African culture is. Everybody wants to integrate. Everybody wants to, everybody wants to be part of the whole. So nobody wants to say, just because I refuse to cut my girl child, I will be an outcast. So with that, everyone wants to align. And right. you find out that the, 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 the concern for the health, for the well-being of the child is not taken into cognizance. It's all about the dignity of the family. It's all about the name of the family. It's all about the integrity of the family. Forgetting that cutting is not a family issue. It's an individual issue. And what is the long-term effect of this? They said, okay, if you do that, the girl will not be promiscuous. She will be so... But it's not true. Statistically, it has been verified. Those that have worked with sex workers, they did a research on geni uh, genital cutting, and they discovered that there is a high rate of women that are into sex work who have been caught because they feel they cannot be satisfied sexually. So they keep doing it, unlike those that were not caught. How was that research carried out? It, it carried out some, in Nigeria, even in, in Nigeria. Nigeria. Even in Nigeria, it was done. I think it right, was... You're, one. you're one of those who wear uh, the shoes. What will be uh, the difference between those who are circumcised, I don't want to use the word caught like you've been using it, and those who are not? What will be the difference? The difference is the, the health in implication. A lot of them now cannot conceive. If, if you succeed in conceiving and uh, becoming pregnant, when giving birth, that is because the Libya has been caught. So there is a huge, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, a medical person, but I know that there is a whole lot in terms of maternal health, even the health of the child, because when the child is being forced, the head of the child is being forced in a space that cannot come out, it affects both the mother and the child. So a whole lot of health complication, mental health issue, issue of uh, slow self-esteem for someone that knows that I'm not complete. When you cut a woman, she is not complete and can never be complete. So that's what you call psychological effect. Right? Of course. All right. Okay, uh, Peter, I'm going to bring you in, but so let's quickly take a break. And um, our uh, correspondent, Miola, Butua Miola, was on the street uh, to uh, gauge what people know about this. Uh, let's uh, get to hear uh, some views of Nigerians on the streets. Yes, it's been done because of uh, culture. Inheritance, this is what we inherited from our forefathers. We cannot do uh, without it. But uh, cultures evolve. When you find out that this thing is no longer invoked, you move along, you change the culture. But some people are so archaic. When a woman got married, uh -huh, in a private party, there are some things that they will do there. Rasami, so that is a circumcision. Uh -huh. To enable her <coughs> have a safely delivery. So whenever, whenever he's in pregnancy, when you want to abort, if you have, have female woman have not been circumcised, it will find it difficult for a baby to come out easily during a uh, childbirth. I was told that if you circumcise a child, you know, a female child, you understand the um, 
um, um, the person will not be promiscuous. That is just their you know, belief as a den. On, unlike what we are seeing today, if you leave a child unattended to, they say, you know, the person will be, you know, too roundy, you know. Those are the things that we are trying to, you know, avoid. But today, uh, we don't do it. That is why most of our marriages are failing. It's outdated. It's not encouraged because of the evil that accompanies it. The danger on it. Actually, I don't think it's polite for a female to be circumcised. To be circumcised. So, the effect... If they do it for a child that was just born and did the circumcision for her, I think it has effect in, uh, when the child is growing. Right, a cross-section of Nigerians there on the streets of Abuja talking about uh, what they know about uh, female genital mutilation, or otherwise known as circumcision. Now, Peter, you've heard about that. Uh, what are people have got to say about this? Now, tell us, why are women or girls at risk? What are the major risks in this? Well, the, the first one is, is social, but, it, but if I may, uh, there's a big difference between circumcision and mutilation. Right. And here in FGM, it is mutilation. It's a physical cut. It's a physical change in how the reproductive organ is actually uh, used and is perceived. And this is the big problem uh, about the way that we, we perceive this, the, this issue. And there, to be fair on your uh, reporter, they were only men that he talked to, yeah. which is a very biased uh, aspect. If you talk to some females, there might be a very different view. And I can say from my own uh, experience correct. that, it, you know, it, re it really is something that is horrific and has no advantages. And this issue around uh, will a, an uncircumcised woman have multiple partners and all the rest of it, this is, again, it's, it, that, that is uh, wishful thinking in many ways, uh, to be able to justify something that has no justification at all. Now, the, the, the risk is uh, that it happens at a very young age and that child has no rights to be able to stop what is happening. And this is why we must involve everybody. What the Movement for Good is trying to say is, let's reach out to five million girls, boys, men, women, to say, look, let's stop FGM once and for all. The political uh, bodies are saying, we don't want it. This morning, the Minister of Health, when she heard about one case, is determined to follow up that one case to try and, try and stop it. And this is what must be done. So th there is an opportunity now to galvanize social media, galvanize the, the, the young and the less young to say, let's stop FGM and let's stop it culturally. So the traditional leaders who were there to send out edicts to say this is no longer a a norm that we should be practicing. It's illegal to practice it. Secondly, as young people actually themselves talking about it and saying that it shouldn't happen. So when they are parents, they won't ha let it happen. Or their peers or their aunts, uncles, whatever you, to tell them actually this practice is one, illegal, but two, is detrimental to that child. Not only today, but actually throughout their life, the psychological scars that it leaves. Fistula, I've seen it for myself where the, you know, the, the mutilation is so uh, bad that a childbirth coming out actually not only kills the child but mutilates the inside of the womb and, there, and therefore it deteriorates and the young mother uh, urinates constantly, is incontinent um, and has to go through operations. We, we see a lot of them in, there's a fantastic hospital in Akiti that does... Uh, um, uh, 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 these operations and very successfully so. What we have to do is, is really get into the communities and people talking about it and stopping it from happening. Well, I, I get where you're coming from. I know what it means uh, to um, adopt uh, a community-led uh, approach. Uh, it has worked in other areas uh, of Endeavour. Now, you are likely um, using, leveraging on uh, internet or yes. online Social to carry on this uh, campaign but a lot of people who practice this uh, FGM and not uh, mainly online if you want to agree with me so how do you think you can get to your targets uh, by using online 
I, I think online spreads the word. Online gives people information. Online allows that, that communication to take place. As the, you get the noise, you get people talking about it in the sitting rooms, you get people talking about it in the classrooms, you got people talking about it in, in, in the marketplace. And all of this, it, it creates the noise and it creates the uh, interest that perhaps is not there at the moment. 35% uh, are in the southeast. The connectivity in the southeast is actually pretty saturated right. and, and a lot of people either have one mobile per family or some a lot of time have more than one mobile per family and through SMS you report you know we have four million people on you report talking to each other all the time young people and it's zero rated so there's no charge uh, for it talking about your reports um, uh, is meant uh, for people to report on the uh, platform about no, no, uh, what's it's, it's exchanging ideas exchanging right. views it's it's about uh, it's a kind of forum. For it's you know we ask them questions. What do you think about uh, genital uh, mutilation? Uh, usually, it's a mixed population, so you get a better re response and ideas of how you can get communities to talk about this uh, act. All right, Asma, how do you? Um think um, this approach can be um, maximized to ensure that uh, we get the results? Yeah, uh, it's, it's uh, kind of, we can utilize a um, multi-stakeholder uh, approach. approach to this issue. We cannot say just uh, the international community alone can do this work for us, or the government of Nigeria alone can do this work, or the civil society alone can do this work. Has this, there has to be a bottom-top approach to this. Right. In as much as we have partners or help, uh, support from international communities, we have to also go down to the grassroots where it is practiced. And how does that go? It, we discuss, you have a dialogue, interaction with the traditional leaders, with the moral gatekeepers, with the duty bearers. What is expected? The women, we have to also create an alternative uh, jobs for these women because some of them is a way of life, is a basically sustainable livelihood for them. For instance, this, the, the case in Senegal, those women were taken to India, they were trained, they were given an alternative means of livelihood. So when they came back, instead of continuing with the business of cutting, they instead had to do other things, like some learned solar panel works, other spa, a lot of things that they could learn. So what do we need to do? We have to create alternative uh, livelihood for these people. And even the survivors themselves, what do we do? We sh they can map out these uh, survivors in the communities, give them both uh, psychosocial support and also livelihood support, whereby they can be empowered. So moving away from victimhood to survivalhood and to become active change agents in the society, where they themselves will become a voice to fight and uh, also confront these negative social norms or traditional harmful practices that they were themselves victims of. All right, Peter, you are starting with five states. So we mentioned those states earlier on, and those uh, include Ekiti, Eboe, and um, Imo, Oshun, as well as Oyo. Um, for how long do you want to carry on this campaign, this uh, state, and how many other states are you uh, looking at eventually? Mm -hmm. We work on this issue throughout the country. The, the focus on those five states is because they have the, are the highest prevalent states. Uh, Kiti is, is one of the sources of, of FGM. But, it, you know, for example, in, in Lagos, there is a lot of FGM in Lagos. When you, you track back, they come from a Kiti or you're one right. of those states. So it's, it's a difficult to geographically define it. But those five states are the highest prevalent states, and it will expand from there. If we can get those five states to somehow control what is going on and prevent uh, it from happening, then and, and, uh, and, and this conversation, this noise about it uh, being there, then you start to actually eat into the core of, of some of these cultural norms that people b begin to practice. And then it will start, as Next young, way. especially as young people talk about it, they become parents, they be become change, uh, uh, agents and, and champions and, and champions and that that starts to really change things uh, for good and right, that's what Peter, we're thanks for. a lot uh, we have to leave the conversation here and uh, I want to believe we have been able to address it a bit okay thank you um,
Mr. Peter Hawkins is the country representative of uh, UNICEF in Nigeria. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, gender and development experts, Asmao Benzis Leo. It's great having you. Thank you so much, Mr. All right, that has been Nigeria Today on NTA News 24 tonight. Thanks a lot for your time. Join us again tomorrow.